you have cancer, three words that change a life forever. We would like to offer another three words. Be an overcomer. Welcome to the 1% Podcast, where our conversations with other cancer warriors, survivors, and caregivers allows us to give you that extra boost you need to face your challenge head on, live life from a new perspective, and forge a path that keeps you moving free and clear. Now, welcome your host and cancer survivor, Truett Taylor. Welcome to today's episode of the 1% Podcast, the show where we interview young adults who are battling or surviving an unexpected cancer diagnosis. You are not alone, and I promise by consuming today's content, your soul will be fed with the hope, courage, and inspiration you need to keep fighting for today. I'm excited to be on your journey with you today. If you haven't done so already, be sure to head over to 1percentpodcast.com to sign up for our email list to see the latest news and updates for all our guests on the show. You can also check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at 1percentpodcast. If you want to join in on some of our discussions, please join our Facebook group, The 1% Podcast. To contact me directly for content, questions, or booking events, you can email me at info at 1percentpodcast.com. This is episode 48 of the 1% Podcast. So excited to be with you guys today. My guest on the show today is Justin from A Ballsy Sense of Tumor. He and I discuss men's health and testicular exams and also the mental health side of having cancer. You guys don't want to miss my interview. But before we get into an interview with Justin, let's talk about today's 1% Moment of Truth. So if you've been listening to the past two episodes, the 1% moment of truth has been about vocal awareness, the power of our voice, and the power of how we say specific things. Today, I'm going to finish up with a lesson. So if you want to, go back and listen to the last two episodes, but I'm going to do a quick recap of the seven rituals of vocal awareness. And by the end of today's episode, you're going to have all seven rituals you need to practice a better vocal awareness. All right. So, so far, here's what we've practiced. We practice getting in stature, saying thank you, loving and letting go, allowing a slow, silent, conscious breath was the third thing that we just talked about last week. Let's talk about the four remaining steps of vocal awareness today. Number four, I want you to see the edge and arc of sound. It's a little fact for you guys today. The temporal mandibular joint is the strongest and most complex joint in your entire body. It has about 56 moving parts in it. And your jaw is actually capable of thrusting thousands of pounds at once. And the muscle at the base of your tongue is actually the strongest muscle per square inch in your body. So you may have heard the phrase before, don't be the cork in your own bottle. So today I'm going to teach you how to get rid of all that external tension in your jaw and neck area. And there's two parts to this exercise. So stop what you're doing now if you have a chance and grab like a a gauze pad or a washcloth, you're going to need that for the second part of this exercise. So what I want you to do is I want you to take the V portion of your portion of your hand where your thumb and your forefinger meet, and I want you to pull down under your lip line and stretch your jaws. When you do this, it'll kind of help you get rid of any kind of TMJ symptoms you might have, but you'll start to feel your jaw relax and release a little bit by stretching it. So take a couple of seconds to stretch your jaw. All right, so grab your washcloth or your gauze, and I want you to pull your tongue out and down just a little bit. Nothing too crazy. Now, listen, the next part of this exercise, if someone walks in and you're doing this, just explain that you're listening to the podcast and you're teaching you vocal awareness. Don't freak out. And if somebody walks in while you're doing this and making this weird sound, then um, just tell them it's all about science and you had cancer and they can go away. So... What I want you to do is I want you to practice a yawn sigh. So start by like making the letter H sound, and I want you to follow through. So you, your voice is going to soar. It's not going to just make that sound. Don't freak out whenever you hear this, and the sound that you make is going to sound like a dying dinosaur, but it's going to actually help your vocal awareness. So it's going to sound something like this. All right, so remember, don't forget, stand up straight, have your stature, have your L shape with your hand, pull down your jaw, pull a little bit on your tongue and make this sound. Uh... All 
Now, as awkward as, as this is and as that was, I want you to notice the vibration change in your voice. So start again. You can try this for five seconds. Hold your tongue and make the yawn size. Start with the H sound and follow all the way through. So now that you have the first four rituals down, the last couple are this. Number five is to take your time. Whenever you're speaking, slow down. Don't rush through your speech and don't rush through your thoughts. Number six is pay attention and have deeper listening. Practice listening deeper to your inner voice and pay attention to the things that are going on around you. And number seven is three words. Be my self. Don't think of any kind of talk you have to give or message you have to deliver as a presentation. Just be yourself. A lot of times you hear the greatest fear in society is public speaking. It's actually not. It's two things. It's the fear of abandonment and the ownership of our power, which is basically saying it's just the fear of being who we are. Those moments when we hold our breath or look away, we're abandoning ourselves. When we practice vocal awareness, we actually begin to claim who we are. Sound is an expressed emotion. It is your expression. So just to recap the seven rituals of vocal awareness one more time. First is to get into stature. Say thank you to source. Love and let go. Allow a slow, silent, conscious, loving breath. See the edge and the arc of sound, which is the technique of making the V shape with your hand and the tongue exercise. Take your time. Pay attention and have deeper listening. And finally, be myself. So that's the seven rituals of vocal awareness from author Joseph. Be sure to check out some of his YouTube videos. He's got tons of great explanations of this. He's a brilliant man who teaches all across the world. And he's helped so many different athletes and actors and actresses. Um, just got a, a huge, wonderful resume of people he's helped create more vocal awareness and really help get through that process. So now that you guys own your voice and are excellent speakers and you're well equipped to speak in any conversation today, let's talk about my guest on the show. Justin's a stage two testicular cancer survivor and men's health activist. He enjoys sharing his story to promote the conversation about men's health through humor and awareness. If you go on Justin's website, a ballsy sense of tumor.com, you'll see his tremendous amount of blog posts and there's just so many great ideas and such a great educational platform for testicular health. Justin's been featured in magazines and articles all over the world. And if you follow him on Twitter, he tweets about three to four times a day and just is very proactive when it comes to making men more aware of their health and testicular cancer. So enjoy my interview with Justin from A Ballsy Sense of Tumor today on the 1% Podcast. Hey, Justin, welcome to the 1% Podcast. How you doing, bud? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for inviting me on tonight. Yeah, man. Good to talk to you. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier, I've been following you on Twitter for a while, really going um, over your blog posts that you're putting out there. You put out some phenomenal information, man. It's really easy to read and really easy to follow. I love all the uh, self-check posts that you put out there as well, too. It's very informative for people. A lot of us don't do that enough, so I love the way you keep providing advocacy for that. So, why don't you tell all of our listeners a little bit about yourself and who you are? Yeah, so um, I guess I'll start with my name. Uh, <laughs> my name is Justin Burke Beclair. Um, I am currently a testicular cancer survivor of coming up on about two years. Uh, all my remission date, my second birthday, if you will, is March 2nd. So that's about a week and a half from um, when we're talking here tonight. I live in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which is exactly halfway between Richmond and Washington, D.C., mileage-wise. Driving, not so much. I can get to Richmond in about 45 minutes. I can get to D.C. in three hours half the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was actually just up in D.C. yesterday, and it only took me an hour and 15 minutes to get there, and I was amazed. Um, right now, I'm 27 years old. Um, and so I was diagnosed with testicular, uh, stage two testicular cancer, um, when I was 25 in the fall of 2016, um, which that was, I always say 2016, um, was both 
the the first half was like one of the best years of my life, and then it took a nosedive. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, and then uh, I I work in an elementary school as an instructional technology te- uh, and instructional technology coach. And basically, what that means is I help teachers. Uh, integrate technology into their classrooms in effective manners. I used to teach fourth grade for a couple years, um, and I really liked seeing what my kids could do with technology, and I thought this would be a way, rather than impacting just the 25 kids in my class now, I can have an impact on 600 kids across the school. Uh, So a question for you. Do you feel like kids are getting smarter or not since uh, the rise of technology? I think they are getting smarter in different ways. Um, I think technology is really changing how we should be teaching, and we don't necessarily need to be drilling them with computation and remembering random facts, but I think we need to do a lot with information literacy and how to find the information because, um, you know, I can Google search anything, and as long as I know how to vet the information, which I do as a 27-year-old, um, I think that's kind of something that we need. Well, I mean, there's also some people on Facebook who don't know how to vet that information very well. Um, but I, I think I think the generation growing up is now is significantly different than um, the one we grew up in, and I, I think we need to embrace that and make sure that we know, you know, how to help them. I was talking to someone the other day about back when we used to look, use encyclopedias to look up stuff. <laughs> and, um, I know I'm, I'm about 10 years older than you, so you probably didn't do that. But yeah, you would go looking and it's like you had the big encyclopedia set that you ordered from somewhere and it was on the shelf and you would go look up stuff. And um, now it's completely different. So is a, is a encyclopedia like Wikipedia type thing? <laughs> and encyclopedia is like <laughs> encyclopedias. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> anyway, so you're diagnosed with cancer at 25 years old, which is about two years ago. Tell us a little bit about your life prior to your cancer diagnosis. Yeah. So like I said, 2016 was like a, a big year of change for me. Um, in in the in Jan, January, I had applied to a program through Google called the Google Innovators Program, and I was accepted. I was one of 34 people in the entire world selected to go to Google headquarters for a three-day retreat and learn from um, their educational branch and kind of start working on different projects and technology and education. And then I proposed to my then girlfriend, who then became my fiance and is now my wife, in uh, February. And then later on that year, we bought a house and I got a new job and then we got a puppy. So um, I was teaching fourth grade and I was absolutely loving it. So I, everything was going really, really well. Like you, if, if this were a movie, that would be like the raindrops keep falling on my head uh, type of this. Um, and furthermore, my, my health was great. I literally never got sick. I would, I had to, you know, growing up, I had strep throat a lot, but that was, but not enough to get my tonsils taken out, which right. always made me mad. Um, but I had, you know, in in August of that year, I had completed a Spartan run, uh, which is kind of like a tough mud or like a mud obstacle course. Mm-hmm. And I completed it without too much struggle. So everything was going well um, up until I discovered that I had a lump on my testicle. Yeah, so life was normal. Life was good. Everything was great. Then all of a sudden things change a little bit. The day you got diagnosed, actually, before we get into that, what, what kind of signs and symptoms were you noticing that maybe someone out there, um, maybe having something similar right now that you can shed a lot of light on that? What kind of signs were you noticing that something may not be quite right down there? So that, that was with testicular cancer, you can have a lot of different symptoms, but in my case, the only symptom I had was that I had a hard lump on my testicle. Um, it didn't hurt. It didn't, uh, you couldn't see it. Uh, it wasn't throbbing. It wasn't swollen. It basically just felt like a P like a kind of like a BB that you would shoot from like the Boy Scout BB guns about that type of feel, but about the size of frozen pea. Um, and I, I was fortunate enough that my pediatrician growing up and then my family care doctor, uh, once I 
got a little bit older and got out of pediatrics, really reinforced how important it is to do a self-exam, which is really easy. You just do it in the shower. Uh, you just basically grab each testicle and roll it around from top to bottom. Should more or less be it's pretty smooth uh, all the way around. And I noticed in September it was fine, and then it got to be October, and I was doing my self-exam in the beginning of the month, and suddenly there was a hard lump there. Um, and so that that and that was really that was really it. That was the only thing that gave me an indication that oh, there there wasn't anything that I could detect a month ago. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, there's something that's you know it was it was it wasn't like. A, a little lump once they finally, you know, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself again, but once they did surgery and they, I, I got my little pathology report, the lump, what I could detect of the lump was like a tenth of how big the actual tumor was. Wow. So you noticed that. Did you immediately freak out once you noticed the lump or, or what did you do? So I, like I had said, we had just moved in the summer, so I didn't even have a doctor in where we were now living. Uh, I moved about, I don't know, it takes me about an hour and a half driving from where I was, uh, where I live now to, to get where I used to live. And so I didn't even have a doctor. And so my, my first thought was, crap, now I have to find a doctor. And, you know, I, I generally made my annual physicals in the summer because as a teacher, that's the easiest time to, right. to get to the doctor. And so I said, okay, well, not only do I need to find a doctor, I'm also going to need to ask this doctor the first time they ever meet me to grab my balls. Uh, so that's going to, that's going to be a super, super fun discussion. Um, so I, I didn't necessarily freak out about the lump. I knew it was serious just because, you know, it doesn't get a whole lot of media exposure, but I know with like Lance Armstrong and Tom Green and stuff, I, I just knew that was, one thing that was uh, a big deal um, to feel a lump, but I wasn't necessarily, I wasn't freaking out as much as like, okay, what do I need to do next? It was the, the, my biggest hurdle was finding the time to call a doctor because the time doctor's offices are open are the same times I was working. Mm -hmm. And it's not exactly easy to be like, okay, kids go work on your spelling words. I'm going to call the doctor and be like, Hey, I need you to examine my testicles for me. Right. (laughs) <laughs> so you, you made it to the doctor. Now, do, do you prefer a female or male doctor when it comes down to this? You know, at this point in my life, a number of male and female doctors have examined me. And I, like I said, I'm married to a woman. Um, but I, I didn't, I don't know if I have a preference. It's, it's at this point now, it's not as awkward as it was at first, but uh, to be perfectly transparent, when I got in and the doctor was a woman, I was like, "What if, what if there's a reaction here?" And right. I don't want to make. And then I, I had the second thought. I was like, "What if there's not a reaction? Is that more rude?" <laughs> right. Uh, but now at this point, I walk into a doctor and I'm like, "All right, I'm here." Here's my pants are off, and they're like, "Sir, this is the dentist." Right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to do that. Now I joke around. I feel like everyone in Atlanta has seen me naked after all the doctor's appointments, radiation visits and everything else that I've had going on. I'm just like, everybody else has seen it. Why not? So, right. So you, you start the whole process now. Were you married at the time or was she your fiance at the time or girl? we were engaged? Were engaged. Okay. So when you came back and told, you know, your partner, like what did she say about everything? Was she nervous? What was her expectations she was she was great um she was really strong like i i had been bounced around to from a family care doctor to a your um an ultrasound to then finally the urologist and every appointment you know i kept her in the loop and i but i was like no you don't need to take off time from work to come with me Uh, i'm sure they're just going to order another test so the day they told me I had cancer. I was there by myself because I wasn't expecting mm-hmm. to, to hear that. I was just expecting them to be like, all right, now we need to order pathology or something. So I got home and around the same time she got home from work and I said, Hey, you know, I, I have cancer and they're going to have to remove my testicle. Um, and she was very, very strong. I'll, I'll be, I'll admit it. I, I cried that yeah. day because, but I wasn't, 
I wasn't so much upset at the time about having cancer. I was more upset about the, t- the fact that they were going to be taking out one of my testicles because I thought they were just going to remove a tumor, but that's apparently not how you can treat testicular cancer. Um, so it was, it was, and it was, it's also with testicular cancer, it's very curable, but it's also very aggressive. So everything has to move very, very quickly. So the doctor, the urologist told me, Hey, you have cancer. And I said, okay. And are we going to do a biopsy? And he's like, no, we're removing the testicle. I was like, okay, cool. Like how many weeks? And he's like, tomorrow would be great. And I was like, I cannot commit to tomorrow. <laughs> and he's like, well, then we can do it Friday. And this was a Wednesday. And so I was like, all right, we'll do it Friday. <laughs> so, so, um, and, but he, you know, that was the best choice, obviously. And especially realizing that it went from no detectable tumor to a detectable tumor. It, it I forget what exactly the statistics are, but something like, uh, with the specific type of testicular cancer I had, the tumor doubles in size like every month or something like that. So I understand why he couldn't put it off any further. Um, But that's what was most overwhelming to me was not the fact that I had cancer, but the fact that I was now going to have only one testicle instead of two. Why do you think that bothered you so bad? Is it like a a manliness manliness thing? Yeah. And that's, that's exactly what it was. Um, even though it's like, I know when uh, females go through breast cancer and have a mastectomy, it's very clear because you can't see it. You know, generally speaking, my testicles are put away, except for when I go to one of those beaches in France. Um, But, you know, looking at me, you wouldn't know that. Uh, But I think it was, and, and biologically there's really no impact. You, your each testicle independently makes enough testosterone that, you know, I have a full beard so I can still produce enough testosterone and everything. Um, but it's, it was, it, it, it really comes back to a lot of the vernacular I used in college. Like if, if I, you were taking charge of life, you would always say, Hey, you're grabbing life by the balls. Or if somebody said, you chicken out, you know, you have no balls. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it had a lot to do with that. Not so much the f- physical, like th- there's no difference really right. um, now. But at the time, I-, I didn't know that. I didn't I didn't know many people. I didn't know anybody at the time who had gone through that. So you had your testicle removed. Like when you wake up from the surgery, do you immediately go to try to feel down there and see what it feels like just to have one testicle? Um, so I actually refused to feel or look at it for a period of up to almost a week, I think. Okay. Um, when, when they, uh, uh, removed the testicle and they basically put on like a jock strap type thing to kind of support the everything, um, you know, I would pull down the jock strap just far enough so I could pee and then, but I, I would, didn't want to see my testicle area or anything. And so it was, and even when I, I only had to wear that beautiful jock strap thing for like three days. But even when I transitioned back just into normal boxer briefs, I still refused to look at it up until, um, you know, it was probably about a week. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I was kind of making a mountain out of a molehill. I'm not going to show you, but you can take my word for it. It really doesn't look that much different. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is a family show. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was doing a podcast one time and I was saying how I talk about testicles all the time. And so, um, and I was like, uh, but nobody ever sent me a picture of yours. I'll, I'll just take, you can just describe it. And the, the, the host was like, has anyone ever sent you a picture? And I was like, I don't know. I'm too afraid to open pictures half the time when it's <laughs> right. When it comes on Instagram. <laughs> So what type of chemotherapy do they give you when you have testicular cancer and what are the side effects of it? So uh, with testicular cancer, they have um, really two main courses of tes- of chemotherapy that you can have. Um, because I've never smoked anything in my whole life, I was able to have the more aggressive form, which is called BEP, which stands for bleomycin, etoposy, cisplatin, chemo. Um, the reason I bring up the smoking thing is if you, um, the bleo had one of its side effects, potential side effects is lung toxicity. So if you have already compromised lungs from smoking, mm-hmm. they won't give you the BEP. So you have a longer treatment 
you have four rounds instead of three rounds. Um, and, but I think actually once you work out the amount of treatments, duration wise, it's longer, but treatment wise, it's the, the smoking version is shorter. It's still pretty much about as curable. Um, but so what it would be is for five days in a row, I was in my chemo infusion center getting just a cocktail of stuff pumped into me. Um, and so then I'd have two days off and then the following Monday I would get just a 15 minute shot of my bleo. Um, then I'd have a whole week off and then another 15 minute shot of bleo. And then the whole process would start all over again. So I had, I had 21 treatments over 10 weeks, which a lot of the times when I tell people I have chemo they I had chemo for 10 weeks. They're like, Oh, that's really not that long. Well, I had like years worth of some amount of chemo that some people go over years condensed into less than three months. Um, it normally it's done in nine weeks, but my white cells dropped so drastically at one point that I wasn't even allowed to leave my house, let alone get chemo. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and on top of all that, you know, white blood cells being a bad side effect. I had pretty much constant fatigue. My hair had fallen out. Um, I was really, really bloated. I had a lot of feelings of nausea, but never vomited up until the very end of chemo. And then I couldn't stop vomiting. Um, And I also had really bad light sensitivity. Like I basically kept all the lights in the house off constantly and smell sensitivity. And I had obviously no appetite either because your appetites are tied to your sense of smell. Mm -hmm. Um, So, but they said, you know, as my oncologist and my um, nurse both said, like as far as side effects go, I had all of the bad ones that you could possibly have. I didn't have any um, neuropathy in my uh, extremities, which is one thing that I was fortunate to avoid. Um, But I had, and I didn't have lung toxicity, thank goodness. But I had insomnia. Like, if you were to read off a list of side effects from any of those three cocktails, I basically had experienced them at some point. But I was, I was good at communicating that to my doctor and saying, "Hey, I don't feel great. What can we do with this?" But now, is the side effect of treating that side effect going to cause other side effects? Right. And so, always, you know, constant communication with my doctor was huge in trying to make things better. So the cisplatin drug sounds like a lot of the same side effects as the oxaliplatin drug that I have. I know they're both palladium drugs. So the sensitivity, the smell, the insomnia, the, all the, the, the neuropathy all kind of come with those drugs. It's interesting to hear that. When you stopped treatment, how soon did you start feeling better after those 10 weeks? It was a long time. Um, I know it was, it was by July. I know I had felt better. I finished in, and for context, I finished in January. Um, and I, July is when we had our wedding. So I know by the wedding date, I felt physically fine. Um, but I know, you, you know, even through April and through May, I was still not feeling great. Um, I was, I, you know, I kept taking anti-nausea medicine and then I eventually transitioned to like peppermints and ginger, um, ginger candies and that those helped a lot. But I remember thinking, you know, I've been treating side effects from chemo for longer than I had chemo mm-hmm. um, just because it took so long to work all of it out of its bo- my body. And now, you know, like I said, it's been two years uh, to, um, after the fact. And really the only side effects that I still kind of experience are I don't like the taste of plain water. And I don't know why that is, but I just put lemon or lime in my water Mm -hmm. and I still have some uh chemo brain moments where I just can't quite remember what word I'm trying to say or what I was trying to do at the time although right I haven't had any of those moments so far in this episode but knock on wood (laughs) how often do you use that to get out of situations I know I typically try to use it at least once a day to get out of something Oh, I, I use it far often. <laughs> like it, it doesn't, even, and not even in context where it makes sense. Right. Like, oh yeah, I have, I have a, I have chemo brain. They're like, sir, this is a library. You just owe us five cents for a late fee. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's, it's a true thing. Like, it's, it's so hard to explain to people because you don't, it's not like, 
and I joke with my wife a lot. I probably shouldn't joke about this about having like Alzheimer's and stuff um, when I get older. Um, but it's it's one of those things where it's I don't know, man. I always did really well in school, and so I, it's like I know that I'm smart, but then sometimes I don't really feel that way because of the way I can't remember certain things, and um, yeah. it kind of messes with me just a little bit. So, well, yeah, that that was a big part for me because um, I was in the gifted program going up through elementary through high school, and I was I had a 4.0 GPA in college, and it got to the point where I was getting lost in my own neighborhood yeah. because I couldn't remember, and I was like how did I read Harry Potter when I was seven, but I can't remember if I need to take a right or a left on this street that I've lived on for a year and a half. That's crazy. And I don't know if that ever gets any better. Um, It hasn't, I mean, it's been six years for me and I'm still, I have have moments of it, Um, but better than the alternative, right? It's always the way I try to look at certain things. Right. I was reading on your page and you, you you mentioned something about, um, having to deal with like the mental health side of everything as well too, which is something that I would say a lot of people don't really talk about as much. Um, you know, that was one thing for me. Like I started feeling better physically before I did mentally. And it's, if it's like a PTSD sort of like, I don't know, like you were like a prisoner in a, in a way. And it took me a while to really get out of that state, I would say over other things. Um, but I know that's something that you had to deal with as well too. Um, tell us a little bit about that because I know that's something that a lot of men don't really talk about as well too, much less cancer. So, yeah. So that, that was, I mean, you hit the nail on the head there pretty well. I felt physically fine far before I felt mentally fine. Um, like I, I kind of, and it didn't really dawn on because like like you've referenced, I, I've written about it a lot, um, and it didn't dawn on me until how like dark of a place I was getting into, until I went back and I read, you know, some of my posts later. And I remember the one blood post that really sticks out to my mind is when I came home from my bachelor party, and it was like the six month anniversary of finishing chemo. So I wanted to write kind of an update of how I was feeling physically, how I was feeling emotionally. And so it starts off by saying like, you know, I'm not feeling nauseous anymore. Well, I am right now because I just got home from my bachelor party, but that's a different story. And so I'm like, I'm feeling great, blah, 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 blah. And so it starts off super, super peppy. And then it takes a real hard right into, but my psyche is shattering. Yeah. Um, And the big thing is with my cancer experience, everything moved so quickly from feeling a lump to having the testicle removed to starting chemo was a less than a two month span. Um, and then chemo, like I said, was 10 weeks. And then all of a sudden you're in remission. Well, holy crap, I'm in remission four months ago. I didn't even know what that word meant. Mm-hmm. Um, how, and, but you know, you're done with cancer. Everyone expects you to be happy and be like, yeah, you don't have cancer. Yeah, but I haven't had any time to process this. Right. Um, and so I, I went to like traditional therapy for a little bit, but I had a hard time um, connecting with the therapist because A, she never had cancer, and B, she also never had testicular cancer because she was a woman. Um, and so and so I ended up finding an online therapy program specifically for testicular cancer survivors, which was hugely helpful. I wish I had found that sooner in the process because a lot of the things that I had I found would have been a lot help more helpful eight months sooner. Um, But, you know, I just kept feeling down and depressed and I had gone through a period of depression in high school. So I kind of, I knew what to look for. And in high school, it it got really, really bad. Like I waited too long to get, to get help. Um, So when I went to my oncologist for my, I guess it would have been about my 12 month checkup. I, um, I said, he said, you know, how are you doing? And I said, you know, I'm not, I'm doing great physically, emotionally, not so much. Uh, I was like, I just feel depressed all the time. I feel down. I feel flat. I don't feel like myself. Um, and so I went on antidepressants and I'm, I'm currently still on them, but it was a, it was a big thing. And, 
and then also deciding to go kind of public with that declaration because you know i I, like you said not many people talk about that but i think it's something that we need to talk about and it's totally normal to feel that way you going through cancer whether it's from beginning to end is four months like mine or whether you're going through for years and years on end it is they don't call it cancer battle for lightly i know there's controversy with that uh, language but it it is a battle whether you want to say so or not and so it's it's okay and it's i think it's encouraged and i think the more we normalize it in the cancer community i think that's going to only help us and then also help others understand that just because you're in remission doesn't mean you're just going to snap your fingers and get right back to work there's a book out called the mask of masculinity and i I see there one or two people. I can't think of exactly. It may be Lewis Howes. I, anyway, I heard about it on the Lewis Howes podcast. I don't know if he wrote it or if the guy he was um, interviewing wrote it, but it's, it talks about that. It talks about how as men, especially at our age, we were programmed to be a certain way and to distribute, to show masculinity in a certain way, which is now at this point, it's not really a helpful way to show masculinity. And like not like being tough, not crying, not talking about emotions, all those things. And so that's one of those things that, you know, especially with some of the people in my audience, I want to bring that up. Like what's it, it, it's okay to be a guy and talk about cancer and emotions and all those different things. Yeah, I totally I'm going to just buy that book on Kindle right now because <laughs> I mean, I literally have it pulled up on my other screen on it. Who's the author? Um, Lewis Howes. Okay. So, yeah. I, thought, I thought it was him. He's great, yeah. by the way. If you don't listen to him, he's really good. Yeah. I'm checking if they have it in my library first before I. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us why you think it's important think it's, for you to be able to share, share your share. story. So I, I think it's twofold. I think kind of what we just talked about there about sharing the whole story, not just, you know, the, the fuzzy good feeling parts but the whole, so everybody understands that it's, it's okay to not be okay um, and share that and break down those stigmas. But I think the bigger driving force for why I share my story is to get men to open up about their health. Because had I not opened up to my doctor, or my fiance at the time, or some of my friends about that, I, Hey, I just felt something on my testicle and I don't think it's supposed to be there. I, we might not be talking here today. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the sad reality is, um, you know, a lot of, you know, prostate cancer, testicular cancer, a lot of kind of male specific cancers, doctors say that they can be treatable and curable <coughs> um, in if they're caught in early early stages. So I really want to encourage men to be doing their regular self-exams, talking about it, holding their friends accountable, their brothers, their fathers, their uncles, you know, so on and so forth. And also to just kind of normalize it in society. Like it's, it doesn't have to be a shameful thing to talk about your health. And then also, you know, it doesn't have to be this big hoopla to do it either. But that's, that's really the driving force behind why I share my story and why I'm constantly turning, you know, two Brussels sprouts into a pair of testicles so I can demonstrate a self exam. It's just, you know, just to get people talking about men's health because it's not where it is and it's not where it needs to be. And, you know, men are dying too early because of that. When I was reading on your blog, I noticed something like you have your reasons why, you know, you do what you do. And yeah. number one was to promote conversations. Uh, number two is to have an open, honest look at cancer. Number three was to provide a patient friendly resource. And your, your page is great. It, it really, it comes at it with enough humor to make you feel comfortable because it's, you know, we say balls, nuts, all those things like that. It's kind uh-huh. of funny. Right. Um, so it is very educational in a way that makes you feel comfortable. So, um, kudos to you on, on doing that when you were going through, whether it's the chemo, whether it's the, the after effects, what would you say your lowest moment was when you, when you knew that this, this was getting pretty bad, um, whether it was physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, what was your overall lowest moment? 
I mean, physically, my lowest moment was the five days of constant throwing up. Um, I haven't been back to Olive Garden since. Uh, but the I think we kind of talked about when I got... I think, honestly, my lowest moment was when I got back from my bachelor party is, um, you know, that was, that was where I was being like, sometimes if I go back and I reread that post, I was like, holy crap, that was, that was dark. That, Mm -hmm. that, um, that was not a good time for you. Was it a Um, sense of like hopelessness or what were you feeling at that time? You think? I just felt like I didn't know really what I wanted to do with my life because like I I knew prior to cancer, I had terrible work life balance. Like I would work, I'd go to work from seven in the morning to four in the afternoon, come home, work on lesson plans, grading, blah, 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 blah. And I remember having the moment being like, if I died, mm, sure. I've impacted a bunch of kids, but beyond that, what's really my mark on the world. Um, and then I realized, Hey, I don't want that to just be my mark on the world. I want to, I want to be able to do more. And so, but also bringing that together with, Hey, you also need to take care, take some time to take care of you. Um, and it was just a lot going on at one time. And so yes, hopelessness, not having a sense of direction. It was all those kind of things. So what was your turning point? We all have all that hard right turn to be able to have this conversation right now and to be comfortable and have enough courage and vulnerability to have this conversation, you obviously had something happen or you've done certain things to get out of that mental state. I would say, what would you say helped you overcome those low, those low moments that you had? I think really just knowing that my story could help someone else. I know how corny and cliche that sounds, but I think knowing that by opening up, I might let some other guy know, Hey, you know, this is okay to be feeling this way and I don't have to suffer in silence. So I, I think realizing that by keeping that into me, and like I said, I knew how bad depression can get over time and I didn't want, want to get to that point again. Um, I think really just knowing, Hey, if I stay quiet about this and I don't speak up, I'm only perpetuating a harmful narrative. Yeah. Once you started going to counseling and treatment and everything else, did you ever have a moment where you looked back and you, that's kind of what we do sometimes we look back and things aren't as bad as they were. And you started enjoying life a little more. I mean, you know, you're in your relationship, your, your wife probably noticed the difference as well too. At how long and at what point did you notice that things were, you know, I would say happy or, or a little more normal again. I want to say it was probably probably took me a solid year or if or more after finishing chemo till I really felt like, hey, you know, I've I accepted what happened to me. I, I, I guess I'm never going to get to the point in my life that I will understand why it happened, but, um, especially because they don't know what causes testicular cancer. Um like I don't have any family history and it's also not a genetic cancer, but I got to the point where I accepted, you know, Hey, I had cancer. Yes, that sucked, but let's move forward. Um, so it was probably about a year and I don't know if there was like a epiphany turning point, but I just, it kind of, again, this is going to sound super cliche, but I realized I had, I was given basically a second shot of life and I wanted to use it to the fullest without just constantly bemoaning. Oh, this is what happened and I'm never going to move forward from it. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give a young adult guy who's listening today, Mm -hmm. listening today, who's experiencing maybe the same situation that you had. He has testicular cancer and he's going through, you know, a little bit of an identity crisis. I think, you know, having a testicle removed, what kind of advice would you give him that's listening today that you wanted to hear back when you were going through your journey? I think the biggest thing that I would have wanted to hear um, is that simply having testicles doesn't make you a man. It's what you do with your life is what really dictates how strong of a person you are. And I would, one of 
my greatest friends in the testicular cancer community. Um, his name's Dave. He's the CEO of Grid Health. He is a two-time testicular cancer survivor. So he literally has no testicles left. And But you would be hard-pressed to find a greater person in the world. Um, he's compassionate. He's strong. He's open. He's vulnerable. And it's just knowing that, that yes, physically you might be down a man and it's really not bad, but you will become more of a man and a stronger person for sharing what you're going through. You might not like my, I started sharing my story almost immediately. If it takes you weeks or months or years or decades or whatever, but get to the point where you share your story. So ever, so you might only help one person, but you've helped someone. And so that's the best way to pay it forward. Yeah, absolutely. Having cancer, you know, tends to make you live a more intentional life. And I feel like there's a lot of power in storytelling and there's a lot of healing in storytelling as well too. It, it forces you even probably having this conversation, you told this story probably a thousand times, but there's also, there's always something about talking about it that, there may be one little extra thing that that sparks a memory, whether it's bringing yourself out of the past or whatever it is to really, I think, give you a little more gratitude with the situation um, and just being where you're at right now. Obviously, things could have been a lot worse and not just from a cancer standpoint, but just like mentally and relationally and everything else. It could be a lot worse. And, you know, I always feel like gratitude is the key to happiness. And we can if we can hold on to those things that we are truly thankful for. And if we stop and look around, there's a lot more out there that we actually have to look around. And sometimes talking about your story can really generate a lot more gratitude for you and stuff. One of the last questions I ask people, and it's actually not on your list, so I don't prepare people for because I want a really legit answer, is what's the best thing that cancer has done for your life? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think... I think cancer has the best thing that's done for my life is shown me the value of what it's like to make the best of your life. Um, prior to cancer, I said yes to pretty much everything that was um, presented to me, whether it was something I felt passionate about or really wanted to do. I just, I didn't necessarily want to displease people or say no to things, but then that also gave me no time to follow things that I was interested in. And now because I've gone through what I have and I basically, you know, without being melodramatic, stared death in the face, mm -hmm. I now know, you know, if it's something that doesn't seem appealing to me or if it's something that won't cause me to get fired by saying no to, I will just outright say no. And some, some one time I was on this committee that I didn't want to be on anymore. And I, basically just told the chairman of the committee, I didn't want to be on it anymore. And they were like, Oh, why? And I was like, I just don't, you know, I, I it's eating up too much of my time and I don't really feel strongly about it. And, you know, that could have gone really badly. They could have gotten really angry, but they were like, thank you for your honesty. And, you know, I wish I could do, I wish I could say no more sometimes. So uh, I wrote a blog post once called how cancer made me selfish or how cancer taught me to just say no. But I think that is the best thing is I choose how I want to use my time. That being said, I also got did a 12 hour day at work today, but so it's not perfect. Um, but I, more you conscious know, about it, it sounds like, yeah, it's, I'm more conscious about it. And it was something that if I said no to the thing after work today, I probably would have gotten in trouble. So, and I got pizza out of the deal. So that's kind of a win-win there. Yeah. Pizza solves everything. It really does. <laughs> So Justin, how can our listeners connect with you? Um, so the easiest way to connect with me is uh, go on my website, which is ballsysenseoftumor.com, spelled out exactly how it sounds. Um, and then on there are links to my various social media and my email, but I'll also give you those here. On Instagram, where, is, um, where I'm probably most active, I'm just a ballsy sense of tumor. On Twitter, where I'm probably second most active, is absottc because a ballsy sense of tumor was two characters too long for a Twitter handle. Um, I did not think that through originally. Um, 
And then uh, on, I'm also on Facebook, but I don't really use that one too terribly often, but that's just facebook.com slash a ballsy sense of tumor. And then my direct email is justin at a ballsy sense of tumor.com. Um, and I'm more than happy to connect in any of those ways um, whenever you need. But also I live on the East coast. So if you email me at like 9 PM, Pacific time, I'll be asleep and I'll get to you in the morning. Just don't email any testicle pictures and you're good to go, right? For the love of God, please don't do that. <laughs> well, if, if you take a look at your graphic, I mean, you'll know it's you. I would say for sure when it comes down to um, buying you on social media and stuff. Well, Justin, I appreciate you being a part of the show today. I enjoyed having you on. You're actually my second um, guest that has that's had testicular cancer. And I learned together we have one full sack. There you go. <laughs> so many jokes. I mean, I'm sure the jokes are endless. But, but oh, real quick, what's your best like testicular ball nut joke that you have out there? Oh, that is a tough one. Um, I would have to go with. Oh, it's hard to pick just one. Um, I guess the, probably the first one that really comes to mind is when I told and this will become apparent where my sense of humor comes from but I told my dad that I had testicular cancer and they were going to have to remove my testicle and he said well you know that sucks but to keep that ball in there and let it kill you that would be truly nuts and (laughs) I was like thanks dad um this was also the my he uh, like a day after my surgery he sent me a picture and he said, Hey, I found where you should do your rehab. And I was like, dad, I don't know what you're talking about. You don't have to do rehab for having a testicle removed. And he's like, Oh, well I found the perfect place. And it was a moving truck company and it was called 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Like, never ends with you, does it? Right. <laughs> if you can't laugh about it. What can you do? Right? Exactly. Well, like I say, man, I, I really appreciate you being on the show. I've learned a lot from you. I've really, you're, you're, your blog post, everyone seriously go check it out. A ballsy sense of tumor.com. You'll get a ton of information. Um, Justin's got on there, how to perform a self exam. I even like your Valentine's day post where you don't need a Valentine. You don't need a, a partner to check yourself. That's great. Um, but everything that you have on there is super informative. Uh, I know you've got a lot of partnerships with a lot of different people and different links and resources on there as well too. So Justin, I appreciate you being open and being on the show more than that. I appreciate you being vulnerable. Um, like I said, there's a, there's a very small community of us men that are actually vulnerable to talk about um, how we feel and then, and, you know, especially going through the mental side of the challenges mentally that we have with cancer, um, the moments where we break down and we're not tough and we're all these things that we're told we're not, that's, that's not manly, um, having the, the vulnerability to talk about that with everyone, that to me um, it's super authentic and raw. And I think that's what really transcends to a lot of people and a lot of the guys that are listening to this um, and just lets them know it's okay. If we can talk about it and laugh about it, then they sure can as well too, and be a part of the show. So thank you again. I appreciate it. Um, and what we'll do is I'll keep putting links out to your posts and um, get some new people onto your, to your website there. And hopefully we can save a few, a few balls out there. That's the, that's the dream. <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, I appreciate it. Have a good night. You too. We appreciate you spending time with us on today's episode and encourage you to continue the conversation to help you keep pushing forward. For more resources based on today's episode, as well as ways to recommend a guest and connect to Truett personally, head over to 1percentpodcast.com. Be sure to join us next time for more stories of inspiration right here with Truett Taylor on the 1% Podcast.